if you're like me, I like to do things and stay at home for that long. It hard, was hard on me. Anyway, uh, uh, I just wanted to mention uh, right now this coronavirus is, most of you probably know if you're listening to the news at all, it is on the rise. And so, you know, I'm thankful we've got a big enough church where we've got adequate spacing. And I do want everyone to be be careful for that and because uh, as I mentioned in, in Bible study this morning there's there is multitudes of people in Houston church that's got coronavirus right now and and there's several I mean I was told yesterday maybe up to a hundred I, I don't much think it's that big but but I know I did read from Brother Wright that it was an unmentionable amount of people that had symptoms and several that had been tested. Brother Gary Green in Wichita, there's eight in the Wichita Assembly that has it. Brother and Sister Green have it. I don't know if his mother's been tested, but she has all the symptoms they have. She lives with them, so she probably does. Uh, I think he told me Curtis and Karen Golden have it. Brother Larry Bryant's tested positive for it. Um, brother, yes, Brother Prey. Brother and Sister Mackey. So there's several that they've got. They've closed services for today and Wednesday, and they'll see what it looks like next Sunday. But uh, so I'm just trying to tell you so you can be careful. I've asked the ushers to be sure to wear a mask. Don't be shaking hands. If somebody sticks out their hand to shake with you, just take your hand. Just tell them, I'm not shaking hands right now. Brother Smith's asked us not to do that. Don't be foolish. You know, somebody said, well, we all got to die sometime. Well, it don't have to be with coronavirus. You don't have to be, you don't have to die, die because of foolishness. You know, you don't have to, you know, put yourself in, in that kind of position. And remember, Jesus said, your time's always. Mine's not yet, not not yet come. So, you know, it, that's an indication that the Lord doesn't always step in and, and, and hinder things that are taking place naturally. So I just wanted to mention that. Plus, if you're going to come up front and you're going to pray for anybody, I want you to have a mask on. If you don't have a mask on, don't be coming up here and getting in somebody's face and breathing upon them and all of that, be courteous enough to consider others. I mean, I want us to be able to have church. I want us to be able to pray, you know, but let's try to be careful and be considerate of one another. Anyway, you all have always been, uh, uh, you know, obedient people and just always tried to do what's right, and I appreciate that. But I just thought I might ought to mention it just to make sure that that uh, you know that we're kept aware of of what kind of uh, of, of the seriousness of this. I mean, Brother Gene Worthy in Decatur, Illinois, died the day before yesterday with Corona, and so it's it's even though it seems like it is a a small number, only one and a half percent or one point six percent of people who get it die. And that that means you've got a ninety what is that, a ninety eight point four percent chance of living if you get it. Brother and sister Gary Green are doing good. You know. Uh, and so uh, they they are not you know, doctors if you get it, they normally will tell you just stay home, and you know, they won't give you any medication or anything unless you get bad enough to need it. And uh, but uh, they did. They have. There's a few things out uh, that that a person can take that they're taking, and it seemed like it helped them. Or how do we know if it helped or not? If you didn't take it, then and if you don't get sick, you know, fine. If you take it and you don't get sick, well, you don't know if what you took worked or not, but. Anyway, the main thing is is get over it. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll get over it, and uh, so the chances are good. Uh, that's 1.6 of all people, and so it would be probably a much smaller percentage 
if you excluded everybody above 65 years old. Because everybody above 65 years old that gets it, 15% of those people die. So that only means I've got an 85% chance if I get it. I like the 98.4 better. So if you take everybody at 65 and over and exclude them, then it probably drops everybody else down to less than 1% are going to die that gets it. Wouldn't you like to be young, old folks? <laughs> anyway, it's still a high percentage of people that are getting over it. And so, and, and besides all that, we're God's children. And I believe God's helping us. There's only been very few people in the body of Christ that have died. And remember this, everybody that dies, if you die with a heart attack or with a stroke or, or you know, whatever you die of, and you've been tested positive with corona, what is that noise? Sounds like a, sound like a whole bunch of bees. Is that outside or is that in here? In here, okay. Anyway, so um, what was I saying? <laughs> Maybe I, if, you, if you've been tested positive. Oh, yeah, if you've tested positive and you die of, of a heart attack or anything else, it's counted as a coronavirus death. So that ups the, the, the percentage. So we don't really know what the percentage is. Um, you know, and then there's a whole lot of people. You can say there's a great big surge going on. Well, I think we ought to pay attention to all of this. But, but they're testing a lot more people than they've ever tested before. And so that probably increases the numbers of people that's got it because there's a lot of people that's got it that are asymptomatic, don't have any symptoms, and they didn't know they had it. There's people, maybe I've had it, and they didn't even know I had it. You know, there is one guy, 24 years old, that got it, got over it, and he's got it again. So this deal of thinking you're immune if you get it, you won't ever get it again, seems like it may not be right. And it's worse the second time. Is it worse? For that person. It was it? They reported it was worse. Worse, okay. Anyway, so I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. I've read it twice this week, and I've read it before, that statistics do prove if you've got O-type blood, that you're less sensitive of getting it or having a bad time with it if you do get it. I'm O positive. <laughs> oh, Lord. But that may not be true, so I wouldn't, I'm not putting myself any different than anybody else. Huh? Yeah, I was on the news. Their, their facts and statistics has proved that it, it looks that way probably need to do more tests. All right, let's have church. Praise God.
lift my hands in honor and glory to the King. Hallelujahs and blessings and praises now I Yeah.
job. Well, <clears throat> I was reading in Bible study this morning where idleness was iniquity. <laughs> I'm trying to overcome this this iniquity problem. Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't want to be facetious because I still believe in waiting on the Spirit, being still, and letting the Lord lead us. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, I know that we're living in a in a dire time right now. If you're listening to the news, you can't be very perky. <laughs> because it'll break you down. Uh, it, I, I hate to admit it, but I'm embarrassed, you know, with the government of our country. I'm embarrassed from the president down <laughs> that we don't have, you know, men with more morals and women in in both the Senate and the House. It's just, it's just embarrassing. Uh, to me, that our country is where it is. However, I am a Christian, and so I lean to the conservative side of of um, why our government was placed in place like it is. It, you know, our government is a, <clears throat> uh, you know, Peter when he stood up on the day of Pentecost he declared that it was the determinate counsel of God that caused the Jewish people to put Jesus to death. <clears throat> Boy, that sounds like a serious uh, statement, doesn't it? Determinate counsel. <laughs> it just means that it was God's, God had determined. God had decided that this was the way that these things would happen. I don't think that he necessarily even had to plan it. I think it just, uh, you know, I mean, I do think God's plans were definitely in it, but I do believe that the Lord, uh, or that man, God just knowing man, man's ways, uh, he knew what would happen to his son when he sent him to this world. But, you know, I believe that we are, I believe that that early church, Jesus preached the determinate counsel of God. He preached the very truth of God's purpose and God's plans for mankind and the truth of God's word. And he imparted that to the apostles and they preached that same determinate counsel of God and, of course, that's what we're longing for today, isn't it? We're, we're, we're working on getting uh, the words and the purpose of God that was in Jesus Christ fitted into our lives. And, and uh, we know that without God's help, that's impossible. But, but with God, all things are possible. With the Lord working in our lives, and even though the world and... Uh, may be going through a lot of things, but we're not of this world. Jesus told his disciples that. He said, you're not of this world. You're in it, but you're not of it. And God is, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's brought us into a sanctification. That word sanctification means a separation. He separated us unto himself. We're no longer, you know, we're not, I mean, I, I wish the world was different. I wish that we were living in a time that was, you know, and, and look, uh, you and I both know that if you go back in, in the beginning of just our nation, America, 17, in the 1700s, 1776, uh, the, <clears throat> if you just go back to then and then look at all the things that's happened, you know, the... Civil War, or in the, in the war, World War One, World War Two, the Korean War, all of the different epidemics and plagues that has hit this world. Um, we may be wearing masks today, but this ain't this. This is not new. I mean, this ain't the first time anybody wore a mask 
in the early 1900s, they had plagues. They wore masks. In fact, my wife was telling me today their mask was a lot bigger mask than what we've got. I don't know if it's bigger than Sister Gail's or not, but anyway, she's got a big mask. And uh, but I think that's that's probably good. Probably you know uh, the more you can. I, I heard a doctor ask just this last week if you had the chance. I mean, if you had to pick between a vaccine for COVID-19 or a mask, which would you take? She said, I'd take a mask. I couldn't hurt him. I thought, wow. She didn't have much trust in the, in the vaccine, evidently, yet. Uh, yeah, and she was a doctor. <laughs> but my point and my thought is, is that we are the children of the Most High God. He's got us through. And sometimes God allows these things to come on the land uh, because of sins of, of the people and sometimes his people has to go through severe things because of God correcting and dealing with the whole world as well as dealing with his church. You know, we can see in the Bible where God dealt with a lot, of, he dealt with innocent people because of wicked rulers, even in Israel. And... Uh, uh, and so sometimes we suffer certain things, but, but, but he is for us. The scripture says, if God be for us, who can be against us? That is, is you know, that the Lord, he knows what he's doing. And, you know, there was even times like, uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and David, Daniel's time, they said, whether God spares us or not, we're going to serve him. We're not going to serve the gods of uh, your God or gods of the world, but we're going to serve the true God of heaven. And, <clears throat> you know, that's the thing about it is, is that people that are, are serving the flesh, they're, uh, they don't have any hope for tomorrow. Whether I live or die, and trust me, I want to live right now. I'm even in all the problems. I still want to live. I'm I'm still working on what God's asked me to work on, and I'm not finished yet. So if I do die, I'm still planning on finishing my work. I'm still planning on serving Him. You know, I think if if you've got a heart and it's made up. You're, you've, got a, you've made a decision. I'm going to serve him no matter what. I'm going to serve God no matter what comes. I think God looks at you with that kind of determination that I can help that person get through. That's the kind of, that's the kind of mindset that you have to have that causes God to look on you <coughs> with favor. And with fitting into his eternal purpose. I like that, that God has an eternal purpose, that he's got a, a, <clears throat> uh, a, a uh, plan that is finally to end up. You know, I, I think about it from time to time. I can't get very far in my thinking with it. I, don't, I, can, I, I wish I had something to be able to tell you Here's what it's going to be like in heaven forever. <clears throat> I, I, I'm sorry, but I don't, all I've got is my imagination. And so, <clears throat> sometime maybe you could give me a little bit of your imagination on it and help me out just a little bit. You know, because I've told you about the time when <clears throat> Brother, Brother Durham's son, Aaron, uh, you know, I, Brother Patton, he used to make this statement all the time. He said, one of these days, I'm going to sit down by the river of life and hang my feet off in the cool running water and just sit back and eat a banana as long as my arm. And that sounded good to me. I thought, well, you know, I mean, I wasn't, I'm, I don't like bananas all that great, but I do like them Okay. But it just, the way he put it, it just sounded good. You know, like just, everything's going to be lovely and you know, we're going to relax. And you're not going to have to have no sweat of your brow and, you know, just, just relax and enjoy life. 
whatever you like in life. It sounded good to me. So I preached it yeah, that way. You know, I'd copy him. I'd try to say what he said. And one day, Brother Durham's little boy, Aaron, this was when he was just a boy, and, he, and I was talking to him. I, sometimes I had the farm back then, and I believe this was when I was haying, and I'd hire those boys to ride on the trailer, and I'd drive, and we'd pick up bales of hay. You know, they'd throw it on the trailer, and then we'd take it to the barn, stack it in the barn. And uh, I can't remember, but I think it was the time that we was hauling hay. And I was talking to those boys. And Aaron said, he said, I don't want to go to heaven. I said, what? He said, no, I'm not, I, don't, I don't want to go. I said, why? Aaron, tell me why you don't want to go to heaven. He said, I don't even like bananas. <laughs> boy, I thought, oh, Lord, I got to find out what he likes. I got to help this boy out. <laughs> You know, because he, here he is, I preached a message, this boy's thinking, you've done painted a picture of me of heaven, it ain't even, it don't even, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't appeal to me at all. <clears throat> so I started thinking, I need, I got to find some new imaginations about <clears throat> what life is like. I have tried to think about it. I thought about, you know, I thought about houses. Do you need a house in heaven? You know, houses there's to protect us against elements. If it's never going to come, if it's never going to rain, if it's going to be like in paradise, it never rained in the, in the garden. You know, the water came up, the dew came up. I've tried to imagine that. I thought, well, what, did it come up so heavy that you couldn't hardly walk around without sloshing around in the mud and in the grass? And, you know, what was that like? I've, I've had to discount that and think, well, it must have been all right. You know, because, <clears throat> I mean, surely they didn't have to wait around till noon or so till it dried up. I, I, I can't imagine how that works altogether. But it never did rain. <clears throat> <clears throat> never came a storm. Never, the wind never blew hard enough to blow a tree down. Tree, not even a tree limb down. Never was a tornado. I don't know how far it was from the ocean, but it never was a hurricane. Then there was no pestilences, Brother Paul. There wasn't a mosquito one. There wasn't a tick or a, a chigger. Sister Sandra, I did not know that you could pick a chigger off of somebody. I grew up scratching them little boogers and moving them all around on me and then biting me again over and over. And I found out after Brother Jerry and Sister Sandra came to church, that she picked them to chiggers off of Brother Jerry. And I found out they're little teeny weeny red bugs that you can see and you can take, you know, you can take, I've, I've got a little, let, let me show y'all something. <laughs> I have a little knife. Uh, what's that little medical cross? What kind of? Swiss Army knife. This is the littlest one they make. This right here is the mo everybody in here ought to have one. It's kind of like having an iPhone. If you don't, if you didn't get an iPhone when they first came out, and you hadn't kept up with iPhones, you'll never make the bride. <laughs> Sister Crow, I'm just kidding. You know, first time I said that, Sister Crow came up to me right after Bible study, and she said, "Brother Smith, I don't know what an iPhone is, but if I gotta have one to make the bride, tell me where to get it." I mean, she's sticking with she's sticking with this deal. Whatever it takes, <laughs> I'll follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. I forsake all. Well, anyway, this is kind of like this is kind of like that. See this little knife here. This right here. There's my toothpick. I don't know how long it's been since I washed it real good. Don't you? You can't borrow my toothpick. These are my tweezers. These are my scissors. I use them all the time. You can cut your fingernails with them real good because there is a fingernail file in here with a screwdriver, flat end screwdriver on the end. And there's my knife. Better watch out. 
let me tell you, the airlines think this is serious. They'll take it away from you. If you, you try to carry this with you on the airlines, you go through the check through, you lost it. I don't know how many I've bought because airlines is, I've donated several of them to the airlines. <laughs> now I put them in a suitcase and check it. I know, she, she somehow she, she hides her. You know, she's sneaky in some ways. She even has, she stashes money. Yeah. I bet none of you women do that. I bet if I took up an offering today, just of the women give your stash, there is no telling how many thousands of dollars we'd get today. I know, there's somebody in here saying, I don't have a stash. Well, you probably have one after you heard that. <laughs> anyway, um, how come me to tell that? Chairs, get, yeah, I'm talking about what it's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have this message down too good. Do I? I don't even remember what I'm saying. <laughs> oh, God. What heaven's going to be like, you know? Uh, do you need a house? If you had a house, would you need a door on it? Or would you need a window or even a window screen? For what? <clears throat> if, if there's no chiggers, no pestilence, no bugs, no ticks, no mosquitoes, looks like to me, no, there's not going to be any weeds, there's not going to be stickers or burrs. Looks like to me you could just lay down <laughs> in a patch of grass. <laughs> And just rest and go to sleep. But are we going to be productive? What, what's going to happen down through the thousand years? Are we going to have roads and cars? Is people going to work? You know, is that the sweat of your brow? Or can we be productive without, you know, having to, you know, give ourselves every day to the sweat of the brow to accomplish it just so that we can make it through? What's it going to be like? I don't know. My imagination has run out of trying to figure out all that. But I do have to believe that it's going to be good because God is the one that's designed it. And <clears throat> number one, I'm, 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 you know, during the thousand years, man, it's going to be something. I mean, can you imagine watching a thousand years? Can you imagine being in the bride? Working with God. <laughs> I mean, I'm just kind of thinking about how this appearing and disappearing act is going to take place. You know, I'm going to have one of them glorious bodies like Jesus had where he walked through a wall, he sat down with the disciples and ate fish and then disappeared. He didn't give the fish time to digest. I don't understand that. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. Are you listening, Sister Elizabeth? Have you? I mean, is, uh, what is Isabel? Are you listening to? Are you got any thoughts about this? You don't. <laughs> I'm trying to give you some things to think about. Uh, so I don't know exactly what God's going to do but down through the thousand years I know this world's still going to exist there's nation after nation that's going to come in and begin to serve God and the Bible says if you died a hundred years old you'd be cursed if you died that young during the thousand years there will be people, looks like, down in the end of the thousand years that will be old and older than Methuselah, 969 years old. And they'll inherit life, just keep on going. But you'll get to see all what takes place through all these nations. If you're in the bride, you'll rule and reign with Christ for that thousand year period of time and be on the inside looking out, seeing how all this is going to work and knowing what God's going to do, uh, working with him, working with Jesus in accomplishing God's will 
in all of those that will respond to righteousness. It just, I mean, it's just on a greater scale than we are. That's what we're working on right now. I mean, you're working on your family trying to help them develop righteousness in their life where they can be a part of this family of God throughout eternity. Listen, saints, we've got a great hope. Even if you were to die, now none of us are, I don't think, you know, I mean, raise your hand if you'd like to go this morning. <laughs> you know, it's like that guy said, how many of y'all want to go to heaven? And everybody raised their hand except one old man back there. And the preacher said, sir, you don't want to go? He said, oh, yeah, I want to go, but it sounds to me like you're getting up a load to go today. <laughs> well, I'm not interested in going today, but I do want to go. There's something inside of us that helps us to know that we might not be quite ready for that next transfer, that next event in life Now let me let me let me help you remember some things. You remember when God dealt with you? Do you remember when you gave your heart to the Lord? Do you remember when you felt the Holy Ghost so strong and He manifested Himself to you? That you knew God was real. Do you remember when you got the Holy Ghost and God come on your life so strong and so real that you couldn't deny it. <coughs> you may go through some things, you know, from time to time that you get, go through a dry spell. You're, you're, you know, that feeling's not on you anymore. But all you have to do is get back in one of those services. Don't y'all love it when the Spirit of God comes in among us and it's just rich? I'm not talking about just where I'm feeling God, but I'm talking about where I'm saturated with this depth of the Spirit of God that's come in our midst. That's something that I have felt in the body of Christ that I have never felt. I came up in religion, and I felt God strong in those places in many, at many times, but I've never felt God in the same measure that I felt Him here in the body of Christ. And he's manifested himself to us so many times, and that's why we're still here, that God has, has touched us in such a way that his manifesting himself to us was so real that we've settled on the fact that this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the true God. And then, <clears throat> you know, our, our understanding that God's gave us uh, concerning he and his son, Jesus Christ, and the work that he's uh, given Christ as the head over the body. And... Uh, it's all, it's all God's will. Jesus does the will of his Father. He always did and he always will. And eventually, the scripture says, Paul said, that he's eventually going to present this back to the Father. He's going he's to give it back to the Father and say, here, I've done the job that you asked me to do and here's your, here is your work that you sent me to do. And... <clears throat> For us to know, you know, what God is, not only what he has done, but what he is doing. And saints, don't get your, don't get your focus on, on the condition of the world. It doesn't mean that you, you shouldn't uh, care about. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be aware of. But I'm talking about focus. Keep your focus on him. Keep your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and what he has called you to, what you are a part of, and the hope 
that lies within us. Praise God. Thank God for the message that God has given us, what he's brought us to. And as far as this epidemic's concerned, I can promise you, it will, we'll get through it. It'll, it will be over. There will be other things that happens because God is getting this world ready for his judgment seat, the judgment seat of Christ to take place. And so there's other things going to come behind this. God's going to continue to deal with the world. He's going to continue to deal with our nation. I, I've made this statement. I hope God gives us another presidential term of the conservative side that holds up for the church and morality. But I don't have an ounce of confidence in either side. I can just be honest with you. I don't have any confidence in man. My confidence is in, is in him. And if he chooses, if he chooses to, to, to allow the other side to get in power, then I'll, I'll have to accept the fact that God knows what he's doing. And this is for the world. Now remember, remember if you, if you go back to the book of Kings. I believe it's the 17th chapter where it starts off telling about Elijah. And if you follow that story through, when Elijah wound up on the, on the mountain, on top of Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb was the mountain of Zion. That was the mountain. There's where Zion's mountain was. It, it, there were several mountains in the top. Is it, Jerusalem set in the, mount, in the mountain of Jerusalem, and uh, when Elijah was up on Mount Horeb, if you remember, you know, after, after he challenged Ahab to meet him at Mount Carmel, and he challenged the, the, the prophets of Baal and of Asherah, and with, you know, the sacrifice, and, and they, they offered up sacrifices, and, you know, he said, whoever's, when, where, whoever, whoever's God accepts this sacrifice, it'll be the God that we need to serve, the true God. Well, they tried. They hollered out to God. You know, he was, he was a little bit facetious. He said, hey, he said, y'all need to get a little louder. Maybe your God's asleep. He might not be hearing you. That was a little bit. He was digging at them a little bit there, wasn't he? They, they even went to cutting themselves as a sacrifice, bringing the blood among themselves. God never answered their sacrifice. When he began, you know, he's the one that gave them to go first. One of the reasons I'm sure is because Elijah knew the time of the morning and the evening sacrifice. And he knew when God would offer, would accept a sacrifice. There was a certain time for God to, to accept the sacrifice in Israel. And so at the time of the evening sacrifice, he began to offer his sacrifice. And of course, God, you know, he told him, he said, dig a trench around this altar. Fill it full of, get, go get buckets and fill that trench full of water. Now, now pour water all over the sacrifice. Because he said, now the, the God that, that answers by fire and accepts his sacrifice. That's the God we'll know is the real God. So he went through all of those calisthenics and then he prayed to God and a fire came down from heaven and it licked up all the water in the trench. It licked up all the water on the sacrifice and then it, then it burnt the sacrifice, disintegrated it, and proved that Elijah's God And then it, Jezebel found out about it, and she said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you, Elijah, just like you killed my prophets, because I don't know exactly how this took place, but the Bible said he killed all 350 prophets of Asherah and Baal. 
did he do that by himself or did he get any help or you know were they such in a humbled condition that he just started I don't know exactly how that happened it didn't give us a lot of detail on it but he killed them but then Jezebel she steps out you hear this guy could kill 350 men and a woman steps out and says I'm going to kill you and he takes off running <laughs> You think women don't have any power? You think men aren't scared of women? <laughs> oh, yes, I am, honey. I'm, I'm scared of you in certain areas. She's got a side to her that she don't want to cross, I promise you. You know what my mama used to tell my daddy? Mama was four foot ten. He was six one and a half. And I think she fudged, I think she was really 4'9", or maybe just a smidgen over, so she counted another inch. But she used to say, honey, don't you ever forget this. Dynamite comes in small packages. <laughs> <laughs> and she could blow up, I promise. <laughs> anyway... Elijah started running. This, this is a wonderful picture of the Reformation when Martin Luther challenged the Catholic Church. And Jezebel, the beast system back there, said, we're going to kill you, Martin Luther. They put out a literal warrant out for his death. <clears throat> the Bible says Elijah took off running, and he ran and he laid down. Y'all have heard me on this before, but but I just want to remind you, he laid down under a juniper tree, and that, that a juniper tree is an evergreen. It, that's a picture of the word of God. He laid down under a juniper tree and went to sleep. That's the only place those reformers could find any rest. Running from the system of the beast of that day, they rested in the word of God that helped them to know that God was with them and God had anointed them and the word of God was leading and helping them to know that what he had given them to give to the people was, would bring them to rest. It brought those reformers to rest. And of course, an angel woke him up and said, eat, eat this little cake and drink this cruise of water. And he did. And he went back to sleep. <clears throat> that first cake and first cruise of water was a picture of the Protestant movement. That God gave enough in the Protestant movement that brought enough rest to the people of God that they, could, they found the rest of God. They found how to put their trust in Him. They had faith in Him. They, had, they were able to reconcile that God was going to help them and take care of them. God gave great revivals that helped the people of God to know that I'm with you. This is my work. And the angel woke him up again and said, wake up and eat again. He ate again another cake and another cruise of water, which is a picture of the Pentecostal movement that came in 1901 in Charlie Parham School in Topeka, Kansas, that finally went to Houston, Texas, and then to Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California. And from there, people received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and began the, that movement of God began to move across America and brought another rest. Another, he, he ate that and went back to sleep. He found rest. We found greater rest when we received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was a greater manifestation of God and move of God on God's people that let them know that he was real and that they were receiving something that the early church received. And in that, the very core of what God had planned for the ministry of William Souders, the body of Christ was the core of that Pentecostal movement that God has, had brought his people finally to in the rest in the Reformation move, in the Pentecostal movement of the Reformation. And the angel told him, said, you eat this, you're going to need it for your journey. 
thank God, saints, for the Pentecostal, the reformation of the Pentecostal and a Protestant and Pentecostal movement that has brought us to where we're at. Now, I feel that we are already beyond Pentecost. I feel like there's still a Pentecostal people out here, but I think the, the, the body of Christ is finished with the Pentecostal movement, and God has brought us to a place where he's requiring garment change. You know, the, the, when, 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 for you to get in the holy, in, into the outer court, you had to first go through the gate of faith to get in here. It took faith. The next movement, and that was part of the, the Protestant movement. They realized, that's what Martin Luther realized, that the just shall live by faith. That was his message. That it's not a system. It's not religion. It's not just, you know, whatever that, that religion teaches. But this is faith that God puts in your heart that you have some relationship with God, that he's manifested himself to you by his spirit and his presence, and it's caused faith to rise up in your heart and know that there's a God in heaven that's dealing with me as an individual. Hallelujah. And, and thank God for what God did down through the Reformation that brought us to there, <clears throat> the, in the Protestant movement, getting in through gate of faith and then going to the altar, which required sanctification. It required, that's what John and Charlie, uh, uh, who? Wesley, thank you. I couldn't get, come up with that name. John and Charlie Wesley, they begin to teach sanctification. You, got, you have to come out from among them and be separate. You can't live like the world and be a part of sin, but you've got to, you got to come out from the world. You've got to live a righteous life. You've got, to, <clears throat> you've got to act like a Christian. You've got to live right. You've got to come out from the worldly ways in your behavior, your dress, your acting, everything about you. And, and <clears throat> that was a, of the Protestant movement that that was that first uh, cake and drink that Elijah, the type of Elijah had. Then the next was the Pentecostal movement, the laver. Brother Souders always taught the laver was the Pentecostal movement. And that's where you looked into the woman's looking glasses. That laver was filled with water, but it was lined with women's looking glasses. Those were brazen, uh, polished brass that lined that laver. And when those priests looked down in, they could see themselves, and they had to wash themselves and get ready to change garments. Before they could go into the holy place, they had to wash in the laver. It's the washing of the word of God that you and I are, have and are going through that is cleansing us and helping us to know the ways of God and the things that's in our lives that shouldn't be that we have to be washed from. Remember those that group that no man could number in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation, they washed their robes and made them white. What makes you think God's not required that of everybody? See, this is not a, it's not just a free ride. God's imputed righteousness to us until we get to a place that we really are washing our robe. We're going through a process. It's like I was talking about in Bible study today. I think it's important for us to understand iniquity and realize really what it is and really be able to look at ourselves and see that our ways are not God's ways he wants them to be. His, our thoughts aren't his thoughts, and he wants them to be. Our thoughts, his thoughts. And he has to work that in us, both to, what does the scripture say? <coughs> uh, Philippians, both to will and do his good pleasure. Not just will it, 
See, God has to put the will in you. You gotta get to a place where I want to be righteous. I want to change. I want to know what's causing me not to change. I want to know what's hindering me. And then when I do see it, that God will cause me to do his good pleasure. He will work that in me. His, his, we are his workmanship, Paul said. He's, he's forming us. He's molding us in his character, in his righteousness. And God's helping us to get there. <clears throat> and so we're, we've been in the labor, which I believe is, that's where you get knowledge, temperance, and patience. But the next move is the garment change. And that's where I think we are. And I think that's what God's working on. He's, <clears throat> I'll, I'll show you in a minute, but... <clears throat> Uh, when, when Elijah ate those two feedings, which has got us to where we're at, then he journeyed on to Mount Horeb <clears throat> to get in the top of the mountain for us to get in the very crux, the very height of what God wants us to inhabit, what he really, where he really wants us to be. And uh, he, he went in the cave. He found a cave in the top of that mountain. Let me tell you something, saints. Religion is mountains in the Bible. That's what mountains are. Hills are religion. Mountains are bigger religions. The greatest religion that there is in the world is the true religion of Jesus Christ. We're a type of that. The, you know, the church is a type of dwelling in that mountain of God, the highest elevation for man on earth. And, and we have found the cave, <laughs> the body of Christ. You know, the winds, after he got in the cave. It didn't happen to him after he got in the cave. That's why I'm saying, we, we're, we're, we're getting close to the cave today. We're getting close to... God putting us in the hiding place. The secret place of God. That God will protect us from all elements. I believe we're getting there. We're getting close to there. And after he got in the cave, then <coughs> the winds begin to blow. Mm. I, I think they're blowing right now, but they're not blowing necessarily to accomplish breaking up everything in, the mount, in this mountain of religion. Then, then after the winds blew, a fire. Was it earthquake first? Okay, the earthquake. Shaking. Shook that mountain. <laughs> Look, none of this, none of this was far... Uh, Elijah, he was in the cave. None of it had an effect on him. It affected the mountain, but it didn't affect him. And then the fire, the judgment came. And after the fire, there was a still, small voice. Oh God, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and no other will they hear. Don't you want to get there? Don't you want to get to the place that no other voice, you're not, you're not confused by their voices, God's got you fixed, where you know the voice of God and you're not deceived by other, voice, other voices? There's, that, it, you know, <clears throat> have you ever wondered, God, are you talking to me or is this the devil? Who? What the real? <laughs> Please stand up. <clears throat> well, God can get you fixed where you know his voice. He's working that in us tonight, today. He's working. <clears throat> you know some things about God that you know it's his voice. When this wonderful, deep, 
hovering of God, the Holy Ghost come down. Do you know that's God? There's not a person in this building that don't know that's God right. and His presence that comes in among us that just absolutely melts us. I'm telling you, saints, please, with me, begin to ask God to give us more of that. Give us more of that deep covering. That covering that we need. We need your covering. We need your uh, manifestation. We need your presence. We need your, you to be near us. Help me, Lord. <clears throat> Not to just by sheer strength serve you, but just give me some assistance. <clears throat> we need that. Let's don't ever think we can do this with our own strength. But <clears throat> that judgment came, and of course God showed him. Here's what he said. He said, I want you, when he said, <clears throat> yes, Lord, here am I, and God showed him. He said, I want you <clears throat> to go anoint, Assyria, go anoint Hazel, king of Assyria, anoint um, Jehu to be king of Israel, and anoint Elijah, Elisha to take your place, your, your office. And he went down off the side of the mountain, and that's where he met those, that a young man plying with 12 yokes of oxen. What a picture of the Jews in the end of our world. They're still plying with the 12 tribes of Israel, still waiting on their Messiah. <laughs> But when that mantle hit that boy, some way his mantle, God calls that to happen. Do you know what? I don't know if Elijah got so interested in what he's doing that he went up close to it. I don't know if he called him over and said, hey, man, what are you doing? Come on, you need, you need to drink of water? What do you need? Come over here and let me help. I don't know what went on, but they got close enough that his mantle, as his cloak, somehow it brushed him. When it did, that boy felt God in such a way that when Elijah started walking off, that young man dropped that plow, connected to those oxen, and he took out after Elijah. And Elijah turned around and looked at him. He said, what, 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 do you, what did I do to you? He said, I have to follow you. He said, what? I have to follow you. He said, let me go tell my mama and daddy goodbye. You'd... Isn't that how you felt when you came to the body of Christ? Yeah. That I'll forsake all to be a part of this. Somewhere God has to deal with you with that. Yeah. That God has to help you to get to a place that I know in my heart in such a way that I know this is real that I'll leave everything to be a part of it. Yeah. <clears throat> Jesus said as many as left Mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, houses and lands. <clears throat> For my sake, will I give a hundredfold in this life as well as life everlasting in the world to come? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hi, oh, Lord, when I found this, I said, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked. I didn't, just, I didn't just nibble on the bait. I didn't just take a bite. I swallowed bait, hook, and all. I was, ho I was hooked. I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't want to get it free. I didn't fight on the line. I just said, reel me in, boys. <laughs> I'm ready to get me in the boat. And get these Scales off of me. You know, clean this fish. I'm ready to be consumed by the body of Christ. The work of God. My Lord. To think of what God done that he added me to his everlasting plan to let me be a part that he somehow saw something in me that he said, that boy can go. I'm going to make it possible that he can go. I'm going to give him everything he needs to know that he can go. It's, a, it's going to be available to him. I'm going to make it possible.
possible that he has all the faith it takes today to know that he can be a part of it. And I kept hearing the message. I kept feeling the Spirit of God to the point (laughs) that I am solely convinced that I can go. I know it's left up to me to an extent, but it ain't just left up to me. If you'll just do your part, he'll do more than his part. The, <laughs> the prodigal son, he was just walking up the road. <laughs> But when his daddy saw him, what did he do? He took off running. <laughs> I just feel like there's been times that God just took off running for me. Just because I made a decision. He dealt with me enough that I finally said, I'll go. Lord, I'm coming home. I'm going to serve you. This is going to be my life. Your people are going to be my people. Their God is going to be my God. Where they die, I'll die. Hallelujah. I'm committed to it. Hallelujah. Not because of ideology. It's not my idea. It's my absolute faith and hope that God has put in me. It's not been a work. Listen, you're not in a work of man. This isn't nothing man can convince you of. You won't stay in here if God doesn't help. If God doesn't touch you, but when God touches you, it makes all the difference. It's what keeps us coming. Service after service. Following the ministry of God. Look, I know that the ministry is going to make changes. I know they're necessary. For We're going down a road that we've never been before. And so we're having to, by faith, walk with God and change what needs to be changed as he showed us, shows us. See, if God showed you everything you needed to do when you first got saved, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go. Because you couldn't, it's not because you, you, it's not only that you think, oh God, that's too terrible, I can't do that. No, that's not, that's not it. It's this. You can't fathom how you can get to where God's going to take you. You, you, There's no way you can fathom if God showed you everything he's going to take you through to get you where you're going to be. Because you you have no, you really don't have much knowledge or thought of tomorrow, of what tomorrow's going to bring. So uh, it's wise to plan for tomorrow but it's even wiser to live for today and serve him. And <clears throat> saints, let me, let, me, let me counsel you to endeavor <clears throat> to do what I am going to endeavor to do more of. And that is... <clears throat> Let's try, let's not just try, but let's accomplish setting aside some time to get in our prayer closets and just spend some time with the Lord. Just meditate some, just pray. You know, we're living in a society that's so fast-paced that it's hard, it's hard to, to... Give God time. It's my phone. It's ringing on vibration. Oh. So, um, but, but I know if you want to get close to God, if you'll start spending some time with him and talking to him and praying. And let God, you know, meet with you. Let, let me just promise you this. If you'll do what I'm telling you to do, you're going to find God in a greater way in your life. And then 
turn your TV off, get, lay things aside, and give God some time. Read your Bible. You know, <clears throat> they, there's, we, we got so many, we got, we got so many wonderful technologies today that it's just, it's amazing what, what we have in technology. <clears throat> just like what I gave you all this morning in Bible study, you know, I could keep that <clears throat> and find it, go through, you know, all my, you know, organized files, if I keep them organized enough, and, and read that again someday. But <clears throat> I've got an app on my phone that has the Bible. It's called the Olive Tree Bible app. In my opinion, it's the best. It's the best app I've been able to find. Because <clears throat> like that little piece of paper I gave you all this morning, I can copy every bit of that. And and I can in my notes, in that app, there's a place for notes. And I, in that app, I can put, I can, I can just copy that piece of paper. I can make a file in my notes that says iniquity. And I can paste that whole piece of paper in there. And then I can go to every one of those scriptures and I can put a note, a little icon next to that scripture that <clears throat> I can make a note and I can label it iniquity and I can point it to that note in notes that will bring up that whole page. Every scripture I use will point to that page. But I can add another note to that scripture to another thought if I need to. I can touch any word in that app on the Bible and it'll give me the strong definition. I can look in my resource guide and find any commentary on any setting of scripture. I can look up the dictionary of anything in there. I can bring up a, 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 a map of whatever area it's talking about. I can find in the treasure of scripture knowledge all of the um, what do you call them? All of the uh, related scriptures that relate to the scripture I'm looking at. I can search any word just like that and bring that word up at every time it is in the Bible. I can find out if it's the exact same Hebrew word that was used the same word before or the same Greek word that was used in another place or if it's a different word. I'm telling you, we have resources that are beyond the imagination of the human mind. You can pick your phone up and read your Bible and research anything you want to research while you read it. And you can even have it read to you in an audible voice now you're driving down the road but I find that that don't work too good. You know, I, a lot of times I've, I've got an app on my phone that's called Alexander Scorby, King James Version Bible. He reads it. There ain't nobody reads better than Alexander Scorby. <clears throat> a lot of times at night I may wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning, can't sleep too good, so I'll just open up Alexander Scorby and pick me out a book in the Bible and say, read it to me. <clears throat> Let me just tell you something. If you've got insomnia, get you an Alexander Scorby app on your phone and let him read to you. He'll put you to sleep in about a minute or two. And you'll wake up two or three hours later and he'll still be going if your battery holds up. So when you do this, make sure your phone's plugged in so it won't run out of juice. I, I put it the other day, I put it on the book of Acts said, well, read this to me. When I woke up, I think he was in Hebrews. <laughs> and he was still going. I ain't got a clue what he read, but in fact, I didn't even remember very much after he, you know what I do is I, 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 I find things, you know, I still go to sleep 
Many times at night how I go to sleep, I go to sleep quoting the 66 books of the Bible. You know, I, I, I find different ways to do it to, to uh, <clears throat> uh, entertain myself while I'm trying to get sleep. You know, I'll say, okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that's the five books of Moses. After the five books of Moses is the 12 books of the historical books, you know, <laughs> You know, um, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd <clears throat> Chronicles, Ruth, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Those are the 12 books. <laughs> so, I, see, I entertain myself by even telling you what they are and how many there are in each category. Then the prophet, the, the poetic books, you know, uh, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, Songs of Solomon. <clears throat> Did I say five? Job. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Yeah, five poetic books in the Bible. Then your five major prophets, and of course you're 12, and you know. Now I've started, I've started memorizing the 12. How many of y'all can tell me the 12 apostles? The 12 names of the 12 apostles. You know, not, not, you, know <laughs> you read them, you may be able to tell several of them, <clears throat> but if you just learn them, you can learn them in three times four, you know. You know Peter and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And then uh, Philip, Matthew, Bartholomew, and Thomas. And then Judah, uh, then James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, which is all call, also called uh, Judas, not Iscariot. And then Simon Zelotes, and Judas Iscariot, who was replaced by Matthew, Matthias. <clears throat> I just think I just find things like that to do when I'm trying to figure out how to go to sleep. Well, you know, sometimes I'll get through the apostles, sometimes I get through the books of the Bible, but I normally go to sleep before I get done. I wake up sometimes, I think, huh, where did I leave off? <laughs> <clears throat> Saints, <clears throat> that that Elijah. That's a picture of the Jews being grafted back in down at the end of this world. Watch for it. That's one of the telltale marks. When Jews, purebred Jews come in here. In fact, I've been thinking, pray with me about that. I've been thinking about visiting some um, Messianic Jews. In fact, I sold a dog to a, a boy that is a Jew that has joined the Messianic Jew group. <clears throat> And he's invited me to come to North Little Rock to their service. I'm considering some of that. Just to see if God, you know, if it's God's timing, if there's any, any of the Jews that are hungry yet. But I know they're going to get this message. And think about this. After God destroys America, after the bride's made up, and Armageddon comes... Who, what nation in the world could, could take this message on? Who could the bride and Jesus work with that has any knowledge that would keep this up in a second heaven condition that it would never fall away again if it's not the Jew? And look at God's wisdom. To keep the Jew, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, to keep that great gulf fix where there they are still plying with the 12 Yoke of oxen, the 12 tribes of Israel. They know all about <clears throat> the law of Moses. They know all about their father Abraham. They know all about the history of the people of God in the old covenant. They know all about the prophets. They've studied it. As a matter of fact, they could, they could mesmerize your mind with what they know about it that you and I don't know and don't understand. Because that's what they've dealt into. We've been working on the New Testament, fitting it in the Old Testament into it as much as we know how, but a lot of those things don't mean a lot to us, but every bit of it is a beautiful picture of Christ coming to the world, and it's a type and shadow of what he accomplished and what God's eternal purpose was. When they see that, Hosea said, when they see him who's... Side, they've pierced. After two days, 2,000 years, they're going to come to know him. God's 
once held them in that great gulf. The rich man Lazarus wasn't able to get to each other in that gulf because God left Israel. He left the Jews and came to the Gentiles and he's harvested another world, but he's kept those people. See, they are, <clears throat> how did Paul say that? That when he said, <clears throat> they're, we're, we said they're, they're the elect of God. It, <clears throat> Romans 11, let me read that to you, and I'll, I'll get down from here. <clears throat> here it is, <clears throat> verse but this is my covenant, verse, it's in chapter 11, Romans eleven twenty-seven. 27. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they're enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes, for the gift and calling of God are without repentance. God hadn't forgot. He hasn't forgot the Jews, <clears throat> and he will graft them back in. You say, well, what happened to all of those that died. Well, all of those that rejected him, they lost. They're lost. They rejected Christ. They, they were blaspheming the Holy Ghost and rejecting the very power of God that gave them an opportunity. <clears throat> but all of the Jews that, that are serving God to the best of their knowledge, I would say they're, they're, they're God's beloved for his sake. And he will... They'll, many of them will come up in the resurrection. Many of the Jews down through the, <clears throat> that were unjust, down through the old covenant will come up in the resurrection of the unjust. But there's many of them that are going to come back in. You know what they're going to say? Let me kiss my mama and daddy goodbye. Let, just like Paul said, I'm, a, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees. I count all that loss that I might win Christ. <laughs> when they see it, they'll count it all loss. They'll say, Lord, we missed it back there. Our forefathers missed it because of our iniquity. We missed it. But now I found it. Hallelujah. And when they get it, it's going to explode in their mind. And they will they'll get this so fast it'll make your head swim. They won't all, they won't, in fact, the majority of them won't have time when it happens to make the bride, but because, you all know, it takes time to get rid of this nature that we're born of, this, this fallen nature. We're, we're just finding out more about it, you know, how this works and what God's going to do to get us out of here. I challenge you, take that scripture and I, and Leviticus 26, take it home, take those steps, read them, confess them, and see if God don't help you. Confess those things, repent of those things, recognize those things, recognize. I'm telling you, when I studied that, I began to just look at myself, and I, I, I said, oh, God. I'm, I thought, you know, I hate to even tell y'all, but I thought I'm full of iniquity. <laughs> this, this fallen nature, there's things about me that I, I, I wasn't thinking about me doing my own ways. My own, you know, I mean, I knew all of this, but I mean, it just drove it home to me. And I just thought, God, I need you so much. The thing about it is I know that if I don't make myself available to him, he can't help me too much. And we're living in a time that if we're not careful, we'll neglect the Lord. The sin of omission is just as great as the sin of commission. So I'm just telling you, let's work on it. I'm not exempting myself. I, I, I'm, I'm needing more of him. Remember that song we sang? More of Him. <laughs> God, <clears throat> I have all, but what I need is just more of Him. <clears throat> A 
of things, I've had my fill. Did you ever get to a place where things don't satisfy you anymore? There's something missing. It's more him. There is God. All right. Um, <clears throat> I guess we should pray here and, and uh, receive the, the tithes and offerings, give you an opportunity. You know, that is part of your worship. I'm not going to teach on it today, but let me just tell you something. If you don't understand paying tithes and giving offerings to the Lord's work, you're lacking. You're lacking a lot of God's blessings on your life. You know, let me tell you why. It's because God, God knows that, you know, when you put your finances into the work of God, see, I had a man tell me one time, he said, well, I ain't going to give anything. God, y'all got more money than I got. <laughs> I thought, oh, God, you're missing it 100 miles. See, God, God's looking at you. What God wants to know, are you willing to recognize that I am the source of everything you have in life? And if you're not willing to recognize me, not with even the, you know, just the 10% of it. If you're not willing to turn back and say, God, I know you're my source. And God's saying, if you don't recognize me, I know that you don't have much faith in me. But I'm telling you, if you'll recognize me, that I will recognize you. I'll see that you have a commitment. And when you start giving your livelihood to God, that's, a, that's what God knows. That's when God knows. That person recognizes me as the source of their life. And he recognizes giving me back the first part. That's what ties is. It's the first part. You know. I mean, if you got ten chickens, then bring the church one of them. And we'll have chicken for dinner. But see, God recognizes, and then he makes this promise that he says, I'll bring it back to you many times over. I'll fill your barns. I'll bless you. Because he knows when you recognize him first before everything in life. I had a man one time in a minister's meeting. He, asked, he said, I want to ask this question. He got up and he said, I got some saints in my church that are brand new and they can't pay their tithes because they owe a lot of bills. And he said, so I told them, don't worry about paying, don't worry about paying tithes right now. Let's just get you straightened out. He said, did I tell them right or not? One of the men said, yeah, you told them right. I said, no, he didn't. I said, no, he didn't tell them right. I said, no, the Bible teaches a principle. I said, if you wait until he can afford it, he'll never pay it because he'll never be able to afford it because he can't never figure out how to do it. But if he'll start in right away obeying God, God will bless him. Well, I'm thankful because I had a mom and dad that they raised me that way. Man, if we had something happen, if, if something happened, that something happened to our finances and we was in a jam, I mean, I didn't know nothing about it. I was a kid. But here's what my dad would say. Even when he wasn't serving God, when he's backslid, he'd say, did you pay our tithes? He'd ask mama. <laughs> because he felt like as long as we're paying them tithes, God's going to bless us. But if we quit paying them tithes, we're liable to get in trouble. So when trouble came, he wanted, that's the first thing he wanted to know. Did you pay our tithes? She'd say, yes, honey, I paid our tithes. They drilled, you know, I, I saw that their whole life. So when Sister Smith and I got saved and got in church, I just started paying my tithes. I, in fact, I'd done a lot more than that. I'd, and I'd find things the church needed that I'd give to the church. And I'd tell the pastor, don't tell anybody I did this. I want to get blessed of God. I don't want to get y'all's blessing. I want to get blessed of God. So if I get some extra money, I'd give it to the church. I bought PA systems. I bought, well, I ain't going to tell you because you'll take away my blessing. All right, let's pray. Let's pray for Brother Marler in Oklahoma City. He's had a stroke. He's in, he was in surgery this morning at 10 o'clock. I don't know if he's out yet. He has a brain bleed. The last I heard yesterday, he had no function on his right side. 
So it's very serious. Let's pray for Brother Mark Marler in Oklahoma City. They've been faithful to that church for many years and they're worthy of our prayers. Brother Gene Worthy died the day before yesterday with COVID-19 in Decatur, Illinois. And <clears throat> uh, she's home from the hospital and she's, both, both her and Sam have it, but they're both recovering pretty good. Huh? Okay. They, re- they tested positive? They did. Anyway, Brother Sam was on the Zoom meeting yesterday, so, and he seemed to be fine. <coughs> uh, Brother, Brother Dahl's doing fine. He's home, last I heard. He was still on oxygen for a period of time, so, but he was doing fine. His oxygen level was up good in his blood, and he was talking and seemed to be fine. Brother Darren Dahl had it, and he's recovering, doing better. He still requests our prayers. Brother Gary Green and his wife have got COVID. They've tested positive for it, and Brother Larry Bryant's got it. I don't know about Sister Bryant yet. Curtis, huh? Memphis, Brother Don Benfield's got it. Um, Curtis and Karen Golden <clears throat> have it. I'm not sure if they tested, but I mean, he told me they had it, so I guess they have. They're sick. The Mackies have got it. So Brother Green's closed the church in, in Wichita today and this Wednesday and they'll look at it next Sunday and see how it is. So they all need our prayers. Uh, Brother Green and them are doing good. Uh, seem like they're, <clears throat> you know, they have been sick. Neither one of them have any sense of taste or smell. But, you know, that, that's part of it. Uh, Sister Carmen Cano, when she had it, she didn't get her taste and smell back for over a month, maybe a month and a half. So <clears throat> that's part of it. So let's pray for... All of these folks, Sister Cindy has gone to Fort Worth to help with her mother. Her mother's, you know, um, 82, is that right? And she's, you know, having issues with her health. And so Sister Cindy, I know, would appreciate us praying for her. She's, you know, she has a business in in uh, Camden and, and has to put things on hold just so she can go take care of her mom and, so it's, it's, it's tedious when you have to have these uh, things happen and you have these responsibilities that you feel you can't uh, neglect. And so let's pray for her travels and also while she's there that God will help her to, to be able to help her mom and give her wisdom to know, you know what steps to take for her future care. Uh, what else do we need to pray for, Brother DJ? Passed away. How old was he? Mm. All right. Who? Oh, Brother Stan Fisher. Yes, he had, what did he have? Five way bypass. And um, he's doing good, last I heard. He's in home. And so let's keep him in our prayers, though. I'd, I'd like to see Brother Stan get back in church. And he's. Later years of his life, Brother Matthew. Yes. So, yeah, Brother Durham called and talked to me yesterday, and I think, uh, you know, they're, it sounded to me like God's really helping them, getting everything done um, in record time, really. I think all they... <clears throat> like is having the house uh, fixed up, clean, put up for sale, and uh, you know they're they're accomplishing some of the last minute things, that, uh, getting everything ready for taking care of the family and all with all their dad's affairs and and uh, the will and everything. So keep keep brother Durham and sister Durham in your prayers. I miss them, don't y'all? And uh, brother Jacob, he's he's. Went with them. The, you know, they did have the funeral, and that all went well. And so, uh, 
let's let's keep them in our prayers that God will protect them while they're on, doing this travel. Laura Stevens, 12-year-old girl that needs a heart transplant. They're requesting our church to pray. Sister Amber. Okay, so her, her nephew that had a heart transplant is going through further tests and she just wanting us to pray that everything will come out all right. Sister. All right. Praise God. Keep praying for Sister Crow. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep you in my prayer, Sister Crow, because I want to get, I want to be where you're at if the Lord will let me. And, and, but I want to keep my mind, a good sharp mind like you've got. So you're you're an example to us to follow. So keep up the good work. Yes, he has. Praise God. There you are. All right. <clears throat> what else? Anything else? Brother Daniels. Yes, he wasn't feeling good enough to come in today. Uh, Brother uh, Caleb had he had some studies that he wasn't aware until late that that he's got to have ready for Monday morning. He said, if I can get it done, if I work on it all day Sunday, I might get done. Pray for me. He said, please excuse me today. But he said, I didn't realize before today, this morning, that he he realized there's something I missed that has to be done that I've got to get done. So pray for him. Sister who? Yes, Sister Brenda Ratliff. Also, Sister Nona, is she's out of town. Her grandson's getting married in California, and so she's there. Uh, I think he's getting married, moving back to Arkansas. Let's pray for Sister Nona's grandson. He'll get in church. Um, I don't remember. I may be telling the story. Yeah, that's what I heard from somewhere. Anyway, so... Pray for that, Brother Dodson. Keith. All right. Pray for Brother Keith. He wants to make more money so he can pay more tithes. <laughs> Praise God. Um, Sister Julie. Okay, yes, Brother Joe and Sister Ruth, also uh, Brother and Sister Boyd, they went to Springfield for the weekend. He thought he'd make it back for today, but evidently he had some, a hiccup that prevented that, so pray for their travels. We got several out today. Brother and Sister McGowan, they did contact me. They have some kind of an ox in the ditch, Sister Fisher. I'm not sure what kind of ox it is, but... It prevented them both from being here, and that's a, that's unusual for the McGowans. Most of the time, even with an auction ditch, one of them will get here. So <laughs> let's pray for them. But there's there's many out today, huh? Yeah, she's talking about Donna Henderson's son. He he was in this church for a little bit of time. I know he didn't probably get a vision what we were all about at the time, but he does have a heart towards God. That was obvious. And so keep him in your prayers. Also, Sister Donna, you know, she's her heart and Ann. And so uh, so there's just several that are out today. I, I think I counted over 20 people that are missing church today for different reasons so 
let's remember them, the McPhees. Keep praying for them. I've been told it's Brother McPhee that is just really fearful of this coronavirus, and he just doesn't want to get in any crowds. But uh, anyway, pray for them. We certainly don't want to lose the McPhees when this gets over with. We're hoping we can get people back in here. Brother Matt, again? Brother Ray Weaver, yes, and Susan, remember them. Uh, all right, let's stand and ask God to help us here. If the ushers will come, we'll, we'll receive your, your tithes and offerings. Remember your pledges that you pledge for that's due in January. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. God, for your goodness. Lord, remember these needs that we have mentioned here today. Oh, God, your precious people, these that have COVID, uh, this virus, God, in the body of Christ, we ask you to help them, Lord, touch them. God, let your healing reach down and lift them up from this disease, oh, God. And then these others that, were, that we've mentioned here today, Lord, Oh, God, the families of those that have passed, we pray for your comfort, Lord, and your help. Oh, Lamb of God, hallelujah, hallelujah. God, working amongst all of these needs, Sister Cindy, God, keep your hand on her. And those that are traveling from this church this weekend, those that couldn't make it for whatever reason, Lord, keep them encouraged. God, oh God, we're asking you to help us. Put it in our minds what you would have us to do to build your kingdom even in a greater way, Lord. Oh God, go with your people today, Jesus. Bless them as they give. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. All right. God bless your hearts. the greatest one, forever the same, he rolled back the water of the mighty red sea, and he said, I'm going to lead you.
your hearts. It's good to see all of you. Pray for me and I'll pray for you and I'll talk to you Thursday night. (laughs) God bless your hearts.